What's up, everybody? This is the Coast to Coast podcast here on InsideCarolina.com. We are brought to you by Johnny T-Shirt. Welcome back from wherever you might be joining us on this episode of the Coast to Coast podcast on InsideCarolina.com. I am your host, Joey Powell. Glad that you're here with us. Appreciate you making time out of your busy day and in your life to spend some time with us as we talk about Carolina basketball, Carolina basketball recruiting, everything that revolves in that orbit we hope to bring to you with the high caliber that you're used to uh, receiving things from at Inside Carolina. With me, as always, the two guys that you really want to hear from, uh, Sherelle McMillan and Sean Moran. Sean, what, uh, what, what Motel 6 do you seem to be joining us from? Because if, if our listeners can't see because it's, it's auditory to them, I want to let you know that Sean is sitting in front of a really nice, well-framed door. Uh, Sean, Sean where, where might you be right now? Motel 6 in uh, Santa Barbara. In Santa Barbara. So it's, it's not a Ritz-Carlton? Because I, uh, I heard it was a Ritz-Carlton. I, I, don't, I don't know. I'm not. Uh, I'll let you off the hook just because we're recording right now. Sherelle McMillan, who is not in front of the Ritz-Carlton in Santa Barbara. Sherelle, how you doing, man? Good. I'm here in the wilderness in Wesley Chapel. So it's, it's getting dark earlier. It's, it's fall for real. It like, is. It kind of snuck up on me. I might have to get more lights. Dude, we had a, we had a Zoom meeting for our church council the other night. And it was dark and I looked and it was 7 30. I'm like, God, I don't care for this. I like long days. I like when, when it's nine o'clock and the, I can still hear cicadas and frogs and man, I grew up in the country. Uh, anyway, <laughs> I appreciate everybody joining us. Remember if you're not currently subscribed to this podcast or inside Carolina's bevy of podcasts, make that change right now for once in your life, uh, go ahead and subscribe. We would appreciate it if you would rate and review us. Uh, we love positive reviews, love negative reviews too, because they let us know if we're doing things that you don't like. Because again, we are here for the people. We want to make sure we're delivering the content that you expect and that you appreciate from inside Carolina. But with all that said, let us get rolling and talking about the stuff that you're here for, you the listener. Uh, guys, why don't we start with some updated rankings uh, for the 24 class that dropped on 24-7 Sports this past week. Uh, we saw a rise for most recent UNC commitment, Drake Powell. And one of their number, I would say probably their number one target in the 24 class, Jaron Steven, Jaron Stevenson, excuse me, uh, who is now up to number 10. Both of those local kids from the, the Pittsburgh area, though they do attend uh, different high schools. Sherelle, give us a little bit of insight as to, uh, you know, what kind of relationship those two kids might have with the staff uh, and, and then how, you know, kids of that, I guess, differentiating ranking helps fill out a class you know you, you you can't get all guys in the top 10 regardless of what you say or at least that hasn't proven to be successful on a championship level so how does how do having guys both in the 50s and, and aiming for guys you know in the top 10 and other places especially that are local in your backyard how does that help the Tar Heels in recruiting well those two specifically I think uh, North Carolina identified them very very early um, if you read any of our stuff you kind of know the story about how Jeff Lebo was an assistant uh, high school coach down in West Carteret when he was retired and they happened to play uh, Northwood when uh, Jaron Stevenson went there with Drake Powell as a freshman. And uh, Lebo was just so impressed with both of those players that after he became an assistant, it was kind of a no brainer for him to go ahead and make contact. And he's been the lead recruiter for both for some time. Uh, so that's kind of how that developed from a UNC standpoint. Um, they, they have a good relationship. They've been to UNC football games and basketball games together, even though they go to different high schools and play on different AAU teams. Um, as far as how it will help the, you know, North Carolina is building a class. I think Stevenson kind of has that, you know, top tier talent, not saying that Drake doesn't, but with his size combination um, of skill and athleticism and all those things, he is kind of the prototypical modern four. We, we talked about that with another player or a player in the 2023 class that North Carolina recruited. We talked about it with Brady Manick, or we've talked about it some with Pete Nance, but you see the prioritization with that position by the UNC staff. And <clears throat> Stevenson just, it, it's a complete no brainer. I mean, he's 15, 20 minutes away from campus. You know, he has some uh, connections to UNC and UNC has some built-in advantages. So just makes a ton of sense for him. He was the first player offered um, in the 2024 class by Hubert Davis. That was about a year ago, um, I think it was last October 4th or 5th. Uh, so coming up on a year for him having an offer. Um, and then Drake, you know, he is a, a really good player who is ascending 
and maybe there's those one or two things that keeps him from being someone who leaves uh, college in a year or two. And maybe those things will get better as time progresses. But you need both, as you said, to fill out a class. You need someone who doesn't need the ball in their hands at all times. You need someone uh, who can play multiple multiple positions. You need someone who can cover you in case of injury. And I think Powell does all those things. And then you also need kind of that, you know, top tier home run, five star, first round pick, you know, talent. And Stevenson gives them that. So they kind of got the best of both worlds right down the street. And if they can, they already got Powell, they can secure Stevenson. Then, uh, you know, I'm not going to say it doesn't matter what they put around them, but it'll put them really far ahead in the 2024 class if they were able to land both of those guys. Sean, obviously, you know, having guys like that that are not only kind of in different spots in the, you know, the top 100, they have different skill sets. What does it usually take from a kid who is going into, you know, going into their junior year of high school? What does it usually take for them to, to make those kind of jumps in the rankings? Is it, is it skill development? Is it playing in front of uh, a wider audience? Is it playing different levels of competition? How does that usually take place? I think all, all the factors you just mentioned, I mean, for, for the players going into the junior class now, people are focusing on them a little bit more. I think when you're watching AAU, the, the 15 and under group, you know, people will go check them out as second or third option uh, or just to check out a few players here and there. But once you're going into the junior class, now you're, you're a focus point. If you're, you're playing well in a few games or tournaments, the buzz is going to be going to be bigger, but there's still, especially going into that junior high school season, there's still a lot of volatility that can happen up or down uh, in terms of, of what's going on in the high school season, as well as the AAU season. I mean, even for players going into their senior year, we, we saw a lot of, a lot of movement, but usually it's in, I'd say smaller, smaller ranges, but over the next few ranking cycles, I think there's still that volatility that we'll see, but for the most part, it's just get, I'd say people getting more familiar with these players and what they bring to the table, what their strengths are, what their weaknesses are, but also what, you know, how are people trying to project them long-term, whether that's for college or for the NBA. Um, so I think really all the above, but it, but it also just goes to more of a focus focus um, for a lot of the ranking, ranking experts. Yeah. I appreciate that insight. And I mean, uh, I think your, your juxtaposition of, you know, scholastic then being at 15 and how that all plays with everything is, um, is, is good fodder and is, is good context for Shrill. You're muted, buddy. <laughs> Ricky mistake. Ricky mistake. We've been on zoom for like, That's, you years. can tell it's, it's the off season, man. It's, yeah. it's okay. <laughs> um, so Sean was talking about projecting forward. If you look at Drake Powell, man, I mean, he has the requisite size and athleticism that, you know, the NBA looks for in their wings. I think now it's just putting together that three point shot, um, improving the ball handling a little and then uh, putting on some size. But as far as like build strength wise and length wise and athleticism, I mean, he's already, he's already there um, as far as a frame is concerned. So I think that's important when you start projecting him forward too, is that he's got, he's, he's got something he's, he's going to keep growing potentially, but he's already almost six, seven. So, you know, if he was six, three or six, four, you talk about a few years, <laughs> you know, four years in college, but at six, seven, he's a true wing. And, and that's the size that NBA wings are these days. So he's got that going for him already too. Absolutely. Um, speaking of other recruits that are on the UNC radar, there are some visits that are set up for the next coming weeks. Uh, as we record this here on September the 20th, uh, UNC has their last prospect, uh, according to, you know, what they've told Zayden High. Uh, the last prospect in the 2023 class will be coming to campus on uh, September the 30th for uh, live action with Hubert Davis. Uh, he'll also be joined by 2024 prospect Boogie Fland. Uh, Sherrill, how do you feel like that – I don't want to say how's that visit going to go, but what, what differs when guys come in for, you know, the formerly known as late night or, you know, midnight madness or whatever, now known as live action with Hubert. Uh, what does that, what do those visits usually look like and how do they, how do they differ from a typical coming for a football game weekend visit? Well, I think there's just more energy in general around campus when that happens. Um, we're actually putting together something for next week, um, talking about the history of recruits and, the late night event since uh, Roy Williams arrived and looking back through some of the names that you definitely can tell it's their kind of premier event. 
Um, not every commit uh, that Roy Williams or Hubert Davis has had has been there, but uh, significant recruits who they really, really wanted, top tier guys they've brought to that event. And I think it's because you have former players in the building. Usually there's, you know, 15, 16, depending on the year, a thousand people for a glorified practice with sketches that shows how much the fan base is in to Carolina basketball. So that's always a powerful tool. Um, it's usually centered around one of the better football games. The last time it was in August was when Clemson came to town. So they just, they tried to make those uh, big weekends in Chapel Hill because as we've talked about before, the UNC staff feels like they, they don't have to pitch anybody. You just come to Chapel Hill and you either fall in love or you don't. And I think that's kind of what they operate with. And they use those weekends for that purpose. So that's why it's a little bit different. Um, for Zayden, you know, he's in, I would call it closing time for his recruitment. Um, he's got one more official visit scheduled. I think it's in late August, or excuse me, late October uh, to Arkansas. And that's all he has on the books. I think Boogie, it's an official visit. <laughs> um, it's good to get him on campus, but that one's not even close to being anywhere near the finish line. Um, so they, they need to make an impression on Boogie as well, but for Zayden, this is the last chance for, for UNC to kind of put his best foot forward. And again, Boogie Flan is in the 24 class, so this is not even a, to your point about it, that, that recruitment not even getting close to, to seeing a finish line, much less uh, nearing the finish line. Uh, not really a big deal, but with Zayden High, you know, all the eggs are in one basket, and this will, one way or another, end UNC's recruiting for the 2023 class. Sean, about Zayden High, for a guy like that, we're going to get to talking about the the current roster going into this season now. But for a guy of kind of his status as a late bloomer, how much of that weighs on you know on the minds of um, of a coaching staff? You know, I, I realize they I realize they usually they usually try to put it behind him and rebuild their reputation, especially now when he's the only guy left on the radar. But what is what does the coaching staff see when they see a kid who's a late bloomer like that? And we've talked about before ad nauseum how things have changed, you know, with UNC and how they didn't think they would be recruiting somebody in this class. But how does that how, how does that play into, you know, a kid having late development like that? How does that play into how he may project into college? I mean, with, with high, I think it's a good, good question, because uh, I think even, you know, for me, the jury's still out a little bit as to what what type of talent is he? I don't think he's somebody that's going to make much of an impact in, in year one. We can replay this in a few years if that's, that's totally, totally different. But I think, you know, for big guys that can shoot, uh, that aren't super athletic, I, I think you're trying to just look at what he's been doing over the last two years. And I think he's not a finished product by any means. So once he does get with that coaching staff and with that strength training, I mean, you can, we talked about this with Armando early on, uh, a lot of UNC's successful bigs have not played a lot as freshmen, but they have been very efficient when they do get on the court and they're able to make that freshman to sophomore year leap where they're going from 10 minutes and playing well in that 10 minutes to now being almost starter quality uh, as a sophomore. And I think th those are the guys you need to continue to bring in is Michael High that type of, of player? He's a little bit different than what they've looked at in the past, especially with his propensity to float on the perimeter. Uh, we've talked about it before. His shooting percentages have not been strong, uh, I think around 25% in AAU play. But does he have the right form and technique for that to improve? Uh, so I think sometimes when we talk about late bloomers, we're talking about guys that are jumping you know, fully into the top 10 after not 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 even having that that type of conversation but, but there's also late bloomers that are, are continuing to rise and even if they're not making an impact as a freshman that sophomore junior senior year now they're starter quality caliber players and they're making a, a strong impact in the ACC. so i i think that's probably what unc is looking at especially knowing they watched him early on mm -hmm. he had a hot very hot uh, first live period in the spring cooled off significantly and you know then obviously gg came through but i think right now the the jury's st there, there's the town is there the upside is there but the jury's still out on how will that translate to the highest levels of division one basketball go ahead trill 
Yeah, I was going to say, and there's players um, in the past, I won't name their names, but who have had that one hot weekend and it just happened to be in front of Roy Williams or <laughs> Steve Robinson or Joe Holiday, and they got a UNC offer and went on to have, you know, solid careers at UNC. Um, I, I think w- what there is to like uh, about Zayden, you know, we talked about him a, a lot. He's he's really getting into Angelo Brizzy te- uh, territory with this podcast. <laughs> but um, I think I think what's to like about him, as Sean said, he's he's not a fitness product. And you just look at some of the non-finished products who stayed healthy at UNC. Mm-hmm. If they stay three or four years, more often than not, they turn into really good players. Um, you, you start talking about guys like Garrison Brooks, like Brandon Robinson, um, Kennedy Meeks, you know, those type of players who are in that same, were in that same ranking. I mean, Garrison Brooks is much lower, but in that, you know, 50, 60, 70 range, usually after a few years um, of development, they turn into good players. So um, it's hard to find quality big men. And with the changes coming to college basketball and and potentially the NBA, it's going to be even harder to find quality big men. So when you can get one um, who you know is solid, then you have to take them. I hope that our longtime listeners popped that Angelo Brizzy reference the way that Sean and I both did. That is a that is a deep cut, and I appreciate it. Uh, won't spend a ton of time here, but do want to acknowledge Isaiah Harwell will be on campus with UNC this coming weekend. I don't even know what grade Isaiah Harwell is. I know he's in the 2025 class, which hurts my heart to say. But uh, Shrill, just give us a quick synopsis of what what does this look like when you have a kid on campus this early from this far away? Um, you know, for for just a, a normal football weekend, what what is that usually? What kind of unofficials are those? Oh, it's an it's an official visit. Except, excuse me, all right, it's an official, but no, for a kid that early, no, no, is, no, no, you're right. It's an unofficial visit, but it's an official visit. They just essentially it's the same thing as as, as an official visit. So um, the only difference is they the family has to pay. The for family's it. paying for it. Okay, but thank the, you. he's you know he's going to have tours. He's going to do all the stuff. He's probably will do a photo shoot. He'll see campus. He'll meet with academic advisors. He'll talk to the coaching staff. He'll watch a practice, a shoot around, hang out with the players. Everything that would happen on an official visit, he'll get to do, um, especially because he's coming from so far away. You just don't know when slash if you'll be able to get you know him back on campus living, uh, being from Idaho and going to school in Utah. Uh, so that that's what will happen is just that the family has to pay for it, which you know kind of speaks to their interest in North Carolina. Uh, mm-hmm. We wrote in the Weekly Scoop, a couple of weeks ago, um, look at flight prices from Idaho <laughs> and Utah to Raleigh Durham. Look at hotels for the Notre Dame game weekend. I know because I looked at them for myself, um, and it's very, very expensive in Chapel Hill. So the fact that they're gonna put up that um, um, amount of money on their own tells you, you know, kind of speaks to their interest uh, to UNC. Yeah, I mean they're they're extremely more interested uh, in UNC than that moth is currently in leaving alone as, as we record this podcast. Um, okay. Last thing we want to talk about on the recruiting side of things. You know, we talked about on the last episode that the live period or that there was going to be another live period where coaches could go see players in person. And Sherelle, you've done a great job of documenting it on inside Carolina.com about all the players that Hubert Davis has seen. Just Hubert Davis, since the period opened two weeks ago, or roughly two weeks ago, he's seen Zayden High in person, who was his first stop. His second was Jaron Stevenson. Uh, and then shortly thereafter, saw Drake Powell, Simeon Wilcher, uh, who was also committed, Ian Jackson, Boogie Flan, both in New York, James Brown, Hit Me, and Elliot Cadeau. So I, I have seen nothing from that group other than guys that have offers from UNC right now uh, heavily in the 24 class. I mean, I'm seeing guys that are the lone prospect for their position in the 24 class. What am I missing? Sherelle go. I don't think you're missing anything. Uh, I think all of them also have officially set up their UNT official visits, uh, all the prospects you just named. So it's really just taking care of the guys that you offered, trusting your evaluations from over the summer. Um, I'm sure the assistant coaches who we don't track as heavily, I've seen some of the other prospects who maybe are slightly off the radar or don't have an offer. Um, but yeah, to your point, it, it's been a, a pretty straight shot for Hubert Davis. He's gone to see the players you expect him to see. And we think you'll see Trenton Flowers, another offered player, um, probably by the time everybody listens to this on Wednesday. Um, so a very productive couple of weeks for him, uh, for Hubert Davis, and we'll, we'll kind of see what happens next. I, I wanted to add a little inside baseball as an aside. 
man, like this is not me complaining. It's just opening up to the audience about what we do. Let us tracking, in, Sherelle. Let us tra- in. Tracking this stuff is so difficult because you're texting with high school coaches and you're texting with parents and you're texting with players. But for every one of us at Inside Carolina, there's one at every single school and then there's national guys. So you just like mm. 40 people trying to find out when is UNC going to be in for player X or when is UNC <laughs> going to be in for player Y? Um, so it's it's always challenging to try to get that information. We, we do the, the best we can. Um, but it's, it's, I, I find it interesting how um, that's become like a major deal before maybe five, six years ago. Nobody really cared <laughs> like where coaches were going in the fall evaluation period. But now anytime a coach goes to see any player at any time during the year, like it's big news. So yeah, that's just a little bit how the industry's changed in, in not a long time. Well, it's either flight aware or you're burning up data via <laughs> message exchanges, which data. I'm sure I'm sure Ben and Buck are cool with just because you ain't gonna get the scoop if you're not uh, if you're not paying for the messages. Um, Sean, what I see when I look at that, you know, that travel plan, I see a coach looking at a 24 class with basically one guy at every position, uh, potentially two, if you're looking at lead guards, can North Carolina afford to not bring in guys, one guy at every position, considering the potential excess they may have next year? Uh, I think they can afford not at every position, but I, I think there is such an importance on this class, especially only bringing in one to two guys in, in 23. Uh, we, we know there's the, the exodus that, will definitely happen in terms of players graduating, but who knows what, what else will happen or surprises uh, as well. So I, I think the 24 class is extremely important. UNC has put a, a premium on the class, starting with Jaron Stevenson uh, about a year ago with, with that offer and and clearly making him the focus before they even offered their, their second uh, player in Cam Scott. And then it, it was kind of until, until June. So they've been set, you know, slow and methodical, but, at the same time, they've cast their their net pretty wide across the positions, and uh, they've made it. They've definitely made it their focus um, in terms of who they're who they're prioritizing and and who they want to land. It'll be interesting to see how that is received uh, through these these visits uh, and how soon or, or you know or how quickly they have to ca- cast their net a little bit wider in in some positions versus others. So it's not. Not a 100 percent. You need somebody at every every single position, but you definitely need a a big class in twenty four, in my opinion. I, and I think just as important as who they saw is kind of who they didn't. And of the offered players, you look at um, Trey Johnson. But at the time that we're talking, they have not gone to see him. And then with Cam Scott, uh, you can check out the message board for kind of our, our reporting on that. But it seems like uh, they haven't gone to see him either. So. That tells you, I think, how they viewed uh, the wing in this class, and, and especially uh, post Drake Powell's commitment. So that's just something to, to monitor too. And then a question for Sean. Um, so they they seem like they want a, a lead guard in 2024, correct? Like it seems likely. And the two offers are to Elliot Cadeau and Boogie Fland. Um, one of which, uh, you know, Cadeau could reclass, he could not. Um, but there's fierce competition for him. And then Boogie Fland, we know that pretty much everybody in the country wants. So when do you think they should start expanding that lead guard uh, recruiting board? <laughs> I'm just curious. I'm not, I'm not saying they're not going to get either player, but, you know, he, contingencies. You got to build a contingency at this point. Right. I mean, if, if, right. if you learn nothing in the past six months and said you better have a contingency in place, Sean, go ahead, man. Well, I mean, f- first off, I think we, we know the challenge. You know, obviously, R.J. Davis came from the same school that, that Boogie's at, but I think it's, in general, I'm still – a little skeptical on the New Jersey, New York pipeline and, and how that, how that could potentially filter into, into Chapel Hill down you know, over the, the long term. I think both of those players you mentioned, you know, two, two just completely different types of players, as well as uh, age ranges on, on those players. You have, you know, from the oldest in the class to the youngest, but I think, you know, especially the, the offers are fairly, fairly new for both of them. Uh, and I think, I mean, you can realistically probably go throughout the majority of the high school season, uh, where they're the two primary lead guards that you're that you're recruiting. But when, once you're getting into that that spring AU period, I think that's when you need to 
you need to have a few guys in mind uh, that you're watching. And then offers are probably coming early April uh, if you haven't been given any indication uh, on those two, or if you feel they do want to play it out and you're going to be in a, 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 you know, say a 25% chance with, with a Duke, Kentucky and, and you, you know, insert X school here. Um, so they definitely have some time. Uh, and I think Boogie being on campus and Cadeau being on campus, you can, you can game play it out, but I'd say the spring, spring AUC, AU season is when I would start making other moves. And yeah. Let me play. I'm going to play host for a second and ask you and Joey a question now. So I like this. We talked about the, you talked about the league guard. So what do you think about North Carolina potentially ever, not just in 2024, bringing in a portal point guard? Joey, you go first. Um, I don't see portal point guard doing it. I mean, I, but I, I will say I'm, my old head heart hurts in the name of York Larice and Samuel Tilden's most famous high Ed Coda. Um, I, I, I can't believe that, that Sean is shortchanging the New York to North Carolina pipeline the way that he is. Um, short answer, sure. I don't know that North Carolina would ever go point guard in the transfer portal, but I'm, ask my wife. I'm wrong all the time. So I have no, I, yeah, I, I, have, I have no belief in that answer. Sean? Uh, um, it's a good, good question. I mean, I think it, it depends on, I mean, so many factors go into that in, in terms of maybe how desperate are they? I think it's it's evident that somebody going from mid major up is is definitely not gonna not gonna work. But if you're able to find the right player, as they did with Brady, and uh, hopefully we'll do with Nance, but at the same time, you know they they hit it big with with Brady, but they also saw what happens when you bring in you know somebody that where it doesn't work out, and and point guards definitely the position, just given how UNC UNC plays, where they need that that player being able to learn the system pretty quickly and, and fit in. So I would, I still think it'll, that would probably be the last position they're looking for, but at the same time, if they, they strike out on, on recruits or if somebody goes pro earlier and they're in a bind, I, I could definitely see them, them looking. Uh, and then the question is, are there players that are talented enough and can fit their system that could, that could mesh, mesh with what UNC and Huber Davis are trying to do? That's the big one. And, and Sherelle, I'm going to take my, my hosting microphone back here in a second and turn the question back to you. But I think the big one is uh, most of the time in North Carolina system, regardless of who the coach is, there's so much pressure put on the point guard that I don't know how many guys out there would be good enough to transfer from another school unless they just wanted to come to North Carolina, um, to n- come to North Carolina and actually be an impact player early on. The only way I think it would work would be in a situation where there was a coaching change, uh, which would potentially make it more attractive for, you know, a player of, of high caliber to leave and then make that move to Chapel Hill. Shrill, answer your own question. What do you think? Yeah, I'll be dip- diplomatic and say I don't know either. Um, and the, <laughs> the reason, the reason I say that, the reason I say that is because I still feel like the Roy, Roy Williams experience is uh, coloring how we feel about point guards at UNC. Mm-hmm. Like, is the system still as complicated? Is it still as difficult to learn? Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know. You know, I, I don't have that basketball acumen to, to tell you that. And I think really only Hubert Davis and, and those who follow the program closely, um, you know, maybe Adrian or Trevor could, could give us some insight into that, um, would know. But if it is, uh, as we've seen, more pick and roll and, and more ball screens and more, quote unquote, uh, modern offense, then maybe it's not quite is difficult to pick up. And maybe that's something that we haven't thought about um, in the point guard situation with 2024, if they need one, that uh, it might be easier to fit in than it was before. So I'm, I'm just thinking out loud because I don't have an answer either. I mean, I, I think it, I think it more almost comes down to the to talent level. I mean, I think we've seen UNC be pretty selective with who they're going after. Um, you know, the, the first year Manic, Garcia when he became available, Christian Bishop who didn't really materialize at at Texas uh, so far, and then you know even last year, uh, really just to focus on on two players, both of whom were in either the the G League invite or the the NBA combine. So they've they've set the bar pretty high in terms of that talent. And even last year, there weren't a lot of players, no matter what position, that I think fit that fit that criteria. So I, I know more player, you know. The transfer portal, if no rules are 
are made, there's, there's always going to be that quantity, but it really depends on the quality of, of the talent that's going in there. I think another factor that we probably haven't considered, but would absolutely tilt uh, you know, the potential field of play or court of play in this case towards bringing in a high level transfer to play the point guard position uh, would probably be the amount and the selection of clothing at Johnny T-shirt, right? Like I, I'd, I would imagine that once uh, a potential transfer came to campus, saw Johnny T-shirt, uh, went into their store on, you know, on East Franklin Street and, and was just blown away by uh, the quality, the prices and the uh, selection that they had in that store. Then I think you would probably see a, a potential, you know, potential shoe in transfer from another program. But I think that's really the, the switch there. It's, it's, it's Johnny T-shirt. We're big fans of Johnny T-shirt uh, as, as if you haven't been able to put, pick up on so far. They are huge supporters of Inside Carolina, uh, North Carolina alums, locally owned and operated. They love us. We love them. We want you, the listener slash viewer, to love them as well. If you are an Inside Carolina Premium subscriber, get that extra 10% off the top. You can find the code on the Inside Carolina Premium message boards. Apply that during your next purchase. Thank us. Uh, if you want to kind of slide us some merch on the side uh, with your savings, feel free to do so. We would gladly accept and would shout you out accordingly. Um, but Johnny T-shirt is where you need to be. We talk about these visits coming up with these players coming to campus, you know, football game Saturday. We're actually going to have real fall weather this weekend with a 3.30 kick against Notre Dame on ABC. It doesn't get more football than that, y'all. Well, go to Johnny T-shirt, hit them up, make them part of your game day routine, get the gear, show up to Keene Stadium in the gear, and then cheer as you feel, you know, as you feel so moved. But either way, make sure you're in good gear, and Johnny T-shirt can take care of that for you. Johnny T-shirt and Johnny T-shirt.com. Check them out. We appreciate them. And we hope that you will appreciate them as well. National ads going to run right here. Stick around for this and more on the Coast to Coast podcast. All right, we're back. Thanks for joining us on the Coast to Coast podcast here on InsideCarolina.com. We're thankful for you being a part of the show and listening to us this evening. Uh, Sean Moran is with me. Sherelle McMillan is with me. We've been talking about recruiting at North Carolina. Uh, now we want to talk about practice starting. Cue the Allen Iverson quote. Uh, cue the, the sound bite. But it really is time for college basketball practice, if you, can, if you can believe it. As we record this here on Tuesday evening, September the 20th, practice starts this weekend. And uh, uh, Sherelle, uh, whether it's Sunday or Monday, either way, you've really got college basketball starting in earnest as the calendar flips over uh, and, and as we, we look toward next week. I feel like we just left the season. But things are about to get real and get real quick. Your first impression of, of what do you think practice may look like when the guys all get back on for regular practices as opposed to the fort they had this past summer? Well, it should be uh, more organized. It should be uh, quicker, uh, faster pace. They know what Hubert Davis expects now um, as far as, you know, the things he likes, the drills, the, the, um, the sets, you know, whether they do – five on five, three on three, whatever it is that they do in practice, they have a better feel for it now since they've been through the ones last summer, all through last season, and as you mentioned, um, this past summer. So I think the probably you would see this coaching staff maybe add a few more things. There are some new guys, but I think um, there's so much veteran experience that they can help bring along the freshmen as, long, uh, as well as Pete Nance um, with what to do and how to do it. So I think they'll kind of, I don't want to say pick up where they left off, but um, I think they'll start in much further along than they did, obviously, last year with Hubert Davis being his first year. Um, this year, everyone, you know, pretty much everyone's back, ton of experience. So, um, yeah, I think they can hit the ground running. Sean, assuming Sherelle is right, which is almost a guarantee, what's one thing you would love to see this staff install into North Carolina's offensive uh, arsenal, I guess, for lack of a better term, for the upcoming season based on what they have on the roster right now? Uh, that's a good, good question. I mean, is it, is it, but is it a Ritz Carlton question? I, I want, oh, I want man. peak questions right here. I, I need, I need no, five man. star questions. What, but seriously, what's, I, what's something you would like to see? Well, let me jump in while he's think. Yeah. Um, this may be simplistic, but I, I missed the Carolina log. I feel like that is something <laughs> um, that used to be you could you could bookmark it, you know, once or twice a game that it was going to happen. And the last few years, it's just not as prevalent. You know, I don't know, again, schematically, if that's a change from Hubert Davis, if 
it's the athletes that North Carolina has on the team. But I mean, you could always see it was it was to the point where you could see it coming before it happened just from watching so much Carolina basketball. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I'd like to see the lob return. I think uh, I think that's fun and gets teams energized. They've definitely got the athletes to do it now. And if you want to talk about how how players, especially wing players, can get involved uh, or, or maybe post players who aren't, you know, getting 30 minutes a game, get them a get them a lob or whether it's a baseline out of bounds or, or just running out of the half court. That's an easy way to plug them in. Sean, how you feel now? You feel like you got something you can you'd like to yeah, see plugged I, in? I, well, I mean, I think on the on the lob, a lot of that came from the the back screen, which oftentimes would crowd the paint as well, mm-hmm. which which I know they they got away from. But I think yeah, to Sherelle's point, I mean, the earlier Roy Williams years you used to see that all the time, mm-hmm. uh, and th- there was nothing opponents could do to stop it. And I think hopefully Carolina is at that talent level where things are they're not always going to be clicking on all cylinders, but you know they're the number one ranked team in the country and it'll be fun to to see them i think the lob seeing the lobs you know can showcase where they're where they're at from a competition standpoint but i would say defensively uh they have so much talent um and how tight they played with their rotations last year really five six you know until people got in foul trouble but put in a little more pressure defensively whether that's half court traps or you just picking up a little bit. I mean, you have, you have Trimble that can get after guys. You have, I think it's a good way to get people outside of the starters um, in the game and involved. Uh, and, and, you know, you look at, look at who you could put on, you have Trimble on the ball defender, you have Sty- you know, styles on the wing and, mm-hmm. and him being all over the place. So you have a lot of guys that even if it's just for a few possessions, kind of just change the game up and, and maybe either steal some points or change the momentum, whatever it may be. So that's where I would go on the defensive side of the ball. To your point, Sean, they finished uh, 356 last year in turnover <laughs> defensive turnover percentage um, uh, via Kim Palm. So I don't think there's many more than 356 teams, maybe like 367 or something, but um, definitely in the bottom, you know, the, the very, very bottom of turnover percentage, defensive turnover percentage. Well, and again, Sean kind of alluded to it. Sherelle mentioned it. We talked about roster. UNC definitely has the bodies. I mean, technically, they got the bodies where they could have big to big lobs right now. Um, if if you consider the scouting on uh, of Pete Nance's ability to pass the ball, uh, it would be great to see. And I know North Carolina fans would love that. Guys, I want to kind of walk through um, kind of a unique exercise on how the current freshmen on the roster might be able to endear themselves to the coaching staff or what they can do to earn playing time. Sherelle, you, you succinctly put it when we were doing show prep about, you know, the path to playing time. Um, yeah, I'd kind of look like to look at how these guys can impact the team this coming season. Uh, let's start with Seth Trimble. Um, and Sean, I'm going to come to you first. You know, Trimble's got all of the, if, if you were talking about football, it'd be spark rating and basketball. It's the guy's got all of the you know, the athleticism that we've seen. And I think we saw in a lot of his film last year, he ain't scared of much. He's got some dog in him. His brother could jump out of the gym. What can a guy like Seth Trimble do to play early besides uh, just being behind Caleb Love and, and RJ Davis? I mean, here, here's a guy who's the most talented of the freshmen, but he's also playing behind uh, two of the most talented players on the team that had such a big freshman and sophomore year jump and, and got that experience. So that's going to be hard to unseat them a little bit, but I think ideally if you can have a three headed monster at the guard spot, you're going to be in a great, great position from whether it's changing it up or just subbing to get guys, you know, making sure guys are fresh. So for him, uh, I mean, he already played great in the scrimmage, but if he can provide some on ball on ball pressure, and if he he is such a different player than both Caleb and and RJ in terms of uh, that first step and and getting to the basket and finishing, um, I think if he's just able to play within himself for five ten minutes early on, that's just going to go quick you know quicker. We'll see how the three point percentage goes, but I think we are all concerned he was going to have to come in and be the guy if Caleb was or not the guy, but maybe he's sharing it with RJ if Caleb mm-hmm. had gone. And now he he can be you know third the third player and and there's really not a obviously it's going to take a little bit of experience but there's not going to be a big drop off which is which is the scary part for for um, a lot of opponents this year. Sherelle, for a guy like Trimble, 
I know Roy Williams was often quick to to praise a freshman who could play defense, uh, but his running joke was that he never saw one that could play the defense the way he wanted it played early on in their career. Uh, what would it do for this North Carolina roster to have a player of Trimble's size and, and frame and athleticism be able to spell R.J. Davis or Caleb Love with real aggressive defense for eight to 12 minutes a game? Oh, it would have an amazing kind of cyclical effect on the team. Um, so Trimble with his size, I think he's 6'2", 6'3", depending on who you ask. Um, but again, he's built like a football player and he has tremendous athleticism. So he can guard ones and twos in college. Um, and just uh, getting into those guys for, as you said, five or 10 minutes a game to exhaust them a little further, the starters from the other team um, would do wonders because then RJ and uh, Caleb Love are coming off the bench um, after getting their little bit of rest. And then they're pressing pressing the gas on offense, you know, running them through screens, pushing tempo, all that good stuff. And just imagine last year if uh, when Caleb and them were playing 38, 39, 40 minutes a game, mm -hmm. if they had a five minute break and the other guard had to deal with someone like Seth Trimble for five or 10 minutes, um, just that little bit of separation could have given Love and, and Davis just a little more room, a little more ability, a little more strength um, to, to get by defenders late in games, which North Carolina really, really needed. I mean, they did a good job as it was, but they could be that more effective and efficient if Trimble just gives them that little bit. So I, he should just be out there and he should just play, if it's 10 minutes, just play to exhaustion where mm -hmm. you're just, you're pushing the other uh, guard as hard as possible. Then when you get the ball, you're pushing Timbo as fast as possible. Um, I don't want him to play contained at all, honestly. Um, <laughs> this year, this year, because right. he's in such a situation where, um, with RJ and Caleb in front of him, he doesn't no have to, pressure. as you said, he doesn't have to worry about being the guy. Mm -hmm. So just go out there and just play like your hair's on fire for 10 or 15 minutes, and that will help the team a ton. Yeah, I love that. And and when I'm thinking about Trimble behind uh, Caleb Love and R.J. Davis, and you don't forget DeMarco Dunn is still on this roster too, and it has all the wherewithal to make his jump as well. Um, I, I kind of envision, and this is a little bit of an apples to orange, oranges comparison, but when you're thinking about depth, I'm thinking about you know the Houston teams that have been so good, the Texas Tech teams that have been so good, the Baylor team of two years ago where they had guys that were kind of interchangeable at the guard spot and just – all of them kind of play defense, and they probably didn't have the, the, the capacity or the ceiling on offense that, that UNC has in Davis and Love. But I, I think it's really, really potentially impressive uh, to, to plug in a guy like Trimble like that early on. I love your thought about him playing with his hair on fire and you know leaving it all out there on the court, to, to use an old cliche. Let's move on to uh, the next player, Tyler Nickel. Uh, again, we've talked about our love for dogs on this, uh, on this here show. Um, you know, we, I guess we could, we could follow, uh, the SBCA and, and do some, some ads here, but I mean, aside from going Sarah McLaughlin and talking about our love for dogs, Tyler Nickel also has that ability. I think he's another kid that there's zero, uh, zero expectation on him coming in. Sean, where do you see a guy, a kid like Tyler Nickel making his, uh, making his name or kind of making his bones in this year's roster? I think it's going to be hard for him just given, given the depth, uh, where he's at, but I, I think. I mean, we saw with DeMarco a few times where there are going to be some opportunity, you know, ideally opportunities early on. And if he comes in and, you know, there's a lot of pressure when you're only getting a very small sample size in terms of, of shot attempts, but if he can come in and showcase his, his outside shooting ability, and uh, I don't think anybody's asking him to play lockdown defense, but as long as he makes it where teams aren't able to, to pick on him, I think that th those two factors will, will, could potentially put him put him on the court. Sherelle, do you see any sort of uh, – is there anybody else on the roster that has less pressure on him than Tyler Nickel? I would say probably Jalen Washington. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> All right, fair enough. <laughs> the, the two guys in front of him, you know, Armando Baycott's going to be some people's national preseason player of the year. And, uh, you know, P. Nance, uh, I think one person we talked to, dubbed him uh, an elite level role player, which is not a dismissal. It's a mm -hmm. huge compliment. Um, so I, I think Jalen Washington has absolutely no pressure. And then because of, you know, his injuries and getting back to basketball, um, nobody's expecting much from him this season. Uh, so as far as Tyler Nichols is concerned, uh, you know, he Davis talks about opportunity. Roy Williams always talked about opportunity. There will come a time at some point in the season when someone is injured or they've got four fouls early in the second half 
when nickel or or you know someone else one of the freshmen will probably be called upon mm -hmm. and really what is about for them is being ready for those five or six minutes that's yep. what this season is for them and those five or six minutes if, if they practice right and prepare right will get them ready for 23 24 when they're going to be playing a lot more than five or ten minutes so that's how i see it for really um all the the, the other players outside of really um uh i guess the the starting five trimble uh Dontre Styles and Buff Johnson is can you be ready for those five or six minutes in a really unexpected situation, maybe in December, maybe in February, maybe at Cameron, it, it could be any time. Can you be ready for when that comes uh, with no warning? And Let's, go ahead, Sean. I, I mean, I think we saw that with, with Buff Johnson this year, which was really nice. Yep. I mean, even the, the first time he got put in the game, you're, you're like, March. man, this guy hasn't well, well, but even at the very beginning of the season, and it, and you're like, man, this guy hasn't done anything in over a year, and all of a sudden he's getting, you know, offensive rebounds and and showing his toughness, and then you go to the championship game, and uh, to Joey's point, you know, what he did to keep UNC UNC in that when things were were falling apart. Um, so he was he was ready, but at the same time, that was still really his first year. So, you know, can he almost? make that freshman a sophomore year leap as well um, in the minutes that he's allocated. So let's stay on Jalen Washington since Sherelle brought him up. Sherelle, uh, you know, Washington's big question is coming off of major knee injuries twice. Uh, what's his path to play time this year? I mean, we've talked about the potential is there when he's healthy. Like the kid has all the skill in the world. Uh, we've seen videos floating around the interwebs of, of him hitting, you know, 15, 23 pointers in a row for a kid his size. How does how does Jalen Washington creep into the you know creep into the rotation this year? And and what do you expect from him when he does? Um, yeah, three hundred. By the time you listen to this, it'll be three hundred fifty nine days since his surgery. Um, and he just got cleared to to have full practice. So, I think that kind of went to plan um, as far as his rehab and taking it very, very, very slowly. Um, so he should be back at full health. And now, you know how it is coming off of injuries. It's just about trusting it again and, you know, bending in the knee and jumping and falling down on the ground for the first time, getting a, a sweat, you know, getting hit in the throat for the first time in a year, <laughs> that kind of stuff to get you back in the flow. Um, but as far as playing time, uh, you know, I barring injury, I know Hebert Davis said he's going to play a lot in one of the national interviews he did, but it'd be surprising if he played a lot this season, just because of how good Armando Baycott and, and Pete Nance are, um, or are expected to be, um, but if there is a situation where there's an injury, I think what he's good at, and Sean can give more of a details to have a scouting report, is just he's an elite shooter for a big man. And um, in that trail position on the secondary break and uh, pick and pops, I think he can be pretty lethal from there. And that's not something um, that takes a lot of reps. You, you can still shoot um, even when you're hurt. So that shouldn't be behind uh, at all. Sean, stay there. I mean, do, do you – can he fit into this current lineup and still give them offensive firepower or is it just, Hey, get in there. Don't let there be a drop off from when the other you know post players leave the game. For, for him physically, that's going to be the biggest adjustment. I remember watching peach jam while he was hurt and, and there are a few, few teams that were pushing him around uh, where, where he struggled with that, that base. But I think when you're only playing a few minutes a game, it's, it's easier to, to, negate some of those weaknesses but to Shrell's point uh you know that was something Armando didn't I think everybody was hoping he was going to offer that last year it was just that 15 footer extended and uh Washington has the ability to hit the three be the trailer but I think if he's catching from 15 feet that's his that's his go-to shot and where he's most comfortable at and at a distance where you don't really need your legs so it, it's it's more it's pretty natural for him but I also think defensively, he's got a 7-4 wingspan. That's something just physically that nobody else on the UNC team has, that type of length. So right away, Sturry might be, you know, need some need some time in the weight room. But 7-4 length, that, that's going to bother people just putting your arms up, you know, close to the basket. So I think that that could be something right there defensively. All right. And last one to round out the class. He's been on campus extra time. And I got to think that helps, but I think a lot of folks expected that, you know, there would be a bit of a project uh, with bringing in Will Shaver. So 
Uh, Sherelle, how does a kid like Will Shaver crack the lineup this year? And, and is he, um, is he at a place where he's basically going to be filling space in the paint or do you think he can actually contribute, uh, you know, if he does get five minutes a game? Yeah, I think it's the same situation as Washington. It's not nothing against Shaver. It's just that the guys in front of him, because you, you would expect that there'll be times when Dontre Styles and Puff sure. Johnson man that four spot. Um, there's just so many players, good players, proven players in front of him. That's going to be hard to break into the rotation this season. Um, I think as he continues to develop, uh, Sean saw him a lot in, in high school. I saw him a lot in high school um, with AAU. And I think the things to build around, he, he's a, he has a good shot for someone, you know, his size, 6'10", 6'11". And he's a really good passer for someone to his size as well as 6'10", 6'11". And I think it's more about continuing to, to gain strength, continuing to improve the conditioning, um, and, and continuing to learn how to play big and play against big guys that he'll face in the ACC. But uh, you know, I'd be surprised, barring injury, um, if he was a, a major contributor this season. And that's, again, nothing against him. It's just talented guys in front of him. Sean, you have any expectations for Shaver this year? Uh, not, I, I wouldn't say that this year. I mean, I mean, I think if he was put in a situation on, on the court, I think having that that time against the team last year, just in terms of knowing how to play picket rolls or or how to maybe play a little more more physically against uh, you know teams that have have some big guys. I, I think that could be helpful. And he does have a soft touch. He's you know similar to different type of pick and pop game than Washington, mm-hmm. but he does have a good good touch. Probably a better uh, spot. You know, a good spot up shooter uh, when he when he is set. But once again, there's there's a lot of a lot of talent. But you know, up until the final four and championship game from an injury perspective, UNC was, was pretty, pretty good. Um, you know, injuries happen, knock on, knock on wood, but I think if something does happen, there is the, you know, there is the depth or if we saw what happened in Baylor, all of a sudden two of your starters are out (laughs) and people are thrown in and, you know, styles and styles responded. So it's going to be who's responding. And if you're not, then you're probably getting a quick hook and, and you're not coming back for, for a little bit, just given, given all the other time, which I think we saw just circling back to DeMar- DeMarco Dunn. Cause I think he's a guy that uh, had a little bit of time very early on in the ACC, maybe was handling the ball more than he should have, but he had a few, you know, that game at wake forest, he had a few jump shots. Maybe if one of those goes in there, there's a confidence from both him and, and the coaching staff. And now he's, getting more playing time it didn't didn't really see him much the rest of the year but is he also taking that jump and now he's coming in with more confidence and here's another another guard or another wing that you're able to put in the mix yeah and i'm i'm probably like a lot of uh, our listeners and, and subscribers really interested to see how that that six months on campus early uh helped him if nothing else it had to uh improve his long-term prognosis as a as a prospect uh, even, you know, later in his career as a junior or a senior at North Carolina. And I think that's something for fans to think about, you know, just because you're on campus doesn't mean you have to play instantly and contribute instantly. But guys, you always contribute instantly and you contribute heavily when you're on the show. And I appreciate it. Uh, anything you guys want to throw in before we get out of here, Sherelle? 38-34 UNC on Saturday. 38-34 UNC in college football against the Fighting Irish from Notre Dame. All right. Noted. That would actually cover the spread. I'm not sure where that falls with the uh, with the total, but that would cover the spread, which right now is down to one and a half, I think. Uh, Sean, anything you uh, want to add? It doesn't have to be a football pick, but if uh, if you'd I'm, like to share I, such things, yeah, I'll be I'll be taking UNC minus the point. So ready to ready to go. All right. Well, there you have it. If if those of you who listen to this show get <laughs> down in such a way and uh, have tuned in for that kind of information, you have said information. Either way, we appreciate you guys being a part of this show. I'm thankful for Sean Moran and Sherelle McMillan. I appreciate Johnny T-Shirt sponsoring. I appreciate John Sigley for producing. But I appreciate you, the listener and the viewer, for being a part of our little coast-to-coast family here on InsideCarolina.com. We're glad to be able to bring you another show. Stick around uh, next time. And if you're here for non-basketball reasons, you know there's plenty of other content coming from Inside Carolina day after day after day. Top-level stuff you're not going to find anywhere else on the web, on the moon, on the side of your cereal box, whatever. Inside Carolina is going to be the best in the game for it. But until next time, we appreciate you being here. I am just Joey Powell. We will talk to you down the road on the Coast to Coast podcast here on InsideCarolina.com.
late.